I was working on MedPy this summer primarily on cross sections and with x-ray integration coming along with it since that's where we're sort of moving in MedPy. And just because I'm kind, I, I read a lot of XKCD, so you'll, you'll, you'll see a lot of XKCD comics in here. So I want to thank just off the bat Ryan May and John Lehman for helping me out this summer with everything MedPy. So I started working on MedPy um, back in November, so just as a contributor, um, but then found out about the internship later on, applied in January, and was able to start working here in May, actually. Nice full-time dedicated to MetPy versus just when I got time on the weekends to do so. So when I first came here, I had some initial plans, some stuff that I wanted to do. Um, I wanted to work on automatic field calculation, where you can just take some data set and say, give me potential vorticity. And it would take care of all the pieces, calculate all your derivatives, recognize everything. But of course, there were way too many pieces not quite in place. X-ray integration was not really complete, so that kind of got shot down. But luckily, we had another plan that we're able to go with, something that was a big missing piece that Gempack had, but MedPy didn't really, which is cross-sections. But still with X-ray. And big thing with X-ray is that it opens up a lot of possibilities, as I'll go over and show, but also lots of exciting new problems. So what is X-ray then? It's a Python package for working with n-dimensional labeled arrays. From their documentation, a quote that they have is that it's an in-memory representation of an etcdf file. It's a nice Python object for working with these labeled arrays with coordinate metadata and attributes. And it's really the future of MetPy's data model that what we hope to be going to and basing our calculations around to make things nice for the user. So it's just a quick example of how to use X-Ray. Um, we can just import X-Ray as XR, open a data set, local file name, and if we print out what that object representation is, we see we get a data set, we have our dimensions, and then coordinates with our attached information about the coordinates, and then all of our variables, and a bunch of attributes, all coming from the NetCDF file. One really cool thing is you can do label-based selection. So say we want to just take our heights, so we get our geopotential height variable from the data set, and then along our time one dimension, we want this time, if we want uh, 500 hectopascals along our isobaric, we just go like that, and we get all our 500 millibar heights. Latitude, longitude, with all of our coordinate data and attributes along here. It also has some nice built-in dimension aware calculation, so if we want to take the mean along our three other dimensions, so we just have a vertical profile of average temperature, we can do something like this and just automatically calculate something like this. So this is our average temperature at each of our isobaric levels. The other really cool thing is that it takes care of dimension-based broadcasting. So even though this object is four-dimensional in time x, y, z, and this one was just in the vertical, it understands what those dimensions are, the coordinates associated with them. So when you do a calculation like this, it just gives you your expected result, your perturbation temperature along your four dimensions. One little problem, though, is this is all physical calculations. And in earlier parts, you saw all those attributes. And one of those was units. It kind of dropped off units here. So it's not quite everything that we want just as it is. So there is stuff that we still need to do with it. One of those is projection handling. Um, also included an idea of like systematic identification of variables and coordinates. So we actually know for any given data set or data array that we have, what's x direction, what's the vertical, what's time? Or even variables, what's temperature, what's heights? Stuff like that. As I mentioned, units and 
probably from anything past from the MetPy group, you know that there's perpetual frustrations with units. And well, it's a generic data array package. It's not going to have the meteorological calculations that we need in MetPy. So again, this is sort of my story with x-rays that solves a lot of problems, but also gives lots of exciting new problems. So that brings to x-ray with MetPy. One thing that sort of was already done by Ryan coming in this before I came in this summer was this projection handling from parsing CF projection information in NetCDF files to get nice Cartopi objects to work with for plotting and data transformations. So that was a nice, like two lines of code to get to the CRS object. A lot of that is helping reduce boilerplate. So if we actually look at what's going on in the back end, we end up seeing that there is a fair, where, where is it at? Looking for, okay, so that's the demonstration. If we actually look here at the X-ray accessors, basically it's our way going with X-rays conventions of adding on custom functionality that you can see here there's stuff about units, some basic handling, nothing too bad here, but then we get to this parse CF and there's a lot of things going on. You have to check lat long, custom conditions. You have to fix up the coordinates if things aren't quite right. There's a lot of boilerplate that this call is helping to hide from the user and make things, as I think of MetPy Monday video said, projection magic. So one thing that I came in and do is adding on to this parse CF to not just understand projections, but also to understand coordinate types. Because with a lot of these calculations, and especially with cross sections, you want to know what your X and Y directions are and what your vertical is so that you know how to structure your cross section appropriately. So here, now all you have to do is say your variable dot metpy dot vertical. And you get back whatever your vertical dimension is, you get that coordinate variable. In this case, it's called isobaric three. And it has units, all seems to be good. It's just, again, there, there's a lot of stuff going on in the background, including regular expressions, to make this work out. So if we thought that there was a lot of stuff going on with getting the projections to work out, we can just sort of scroll through all what, 815 additions in this PR? It's a lot of tests. It's, it's a lot of, a lot of it is tests. But then we get to this nice little thing that defines all the different conditions for parsing. Nothing too bad. I mean, as far as regular expressions go, these aren't that bad, but they're still there. I don't understand that. Mm -hmm comic strip that added only one thing, one problem when you added regular. Yeah. Well, it didn't get rid of it. Okay. Or it got, or added more it than it got rid of It got rid of some and added a whole bunch. Have you not heard the joke? I have a problem. I'm going to use regular expressions. Now you have two problems. <laughs> at least. That's what was my point, is at least two problems. <laughs> gotcha. So, that's also their systematic identification of coordinates would be another great thing. Just say, here's my data set. I want temperature from this. Of course, we didn't quite get around to that. So there's open GitHub issue on that. Hopefully, sometime later, someone can take care of that. I mean, it is on our roadmap, on MetPy's roadmap for automatic field calculation, the other thing I had wanted to work about. But again, more steps down the road. So that, then we come to units, and units are always fun to deal with, including between Celsius and Fahrenheit, temperature units. <laughs> yep. So nice functionality, that was when Ryan first did that um, projection, PR implemented all that initial integration, one of the things that came with it was basic unit array handling. So if we just want to take the unit array out of an x-ray data array, we can just say .metpy.unitarray and 
we'll get a nice pint quantity coming out. We can also, most of the calculations are wrapped so that whenever you feed them an X-ray data array, it'll automatically convert to the corresponding unit array, and then you'll get back out unit arrays. So say we want to calculate dew point from temperature and relative humidity, we can just give it this. What I'm doing here is because this is that same four-dimensional data set, and trying to display four dimensions of data in the output would not be pretty. So this is just a single slice. But we can then convert it to degrees Fahrenheit with whatever from whatever unit it outputs it as. Not too bad. If we wanted, though, to do what should be a fairly simple calculation, remember I said before about that coronal wear selection, say we would just want to take thickness, which is just a subtraction of height between two different isobaric levels. We should be able to ideally just do that with X-ray subtraction, where we just select our 500 hectopascal layer, subtract off our 1,000 hectopascal layer, and we get something like this which is good, it, it broadcasts very nicely. We get all of our data across four dimensions really quickly. But if, you, if I scroll down, there, there's missing stuff here. There, there's no units. So that's, a, that's an area of future work that there's stuff happening in the scientific Python ecosystem to make this work a little bit nicer to be able to handle unit arrays within X-ray, some stuff with called duct typing, making sure that different types of numpy, NumPy array-like objects are handled fairly equivalently. So still some frustrations. I'm not sure I would be able to do that with the other first monitor that I used. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, meteorological calculations. That's, the, that's one of the big areas of MetPy, so we want to make sure that we can do meteorological calculations <laughs> with our data arrays and data sets. I, I was glad this one just came out on Monday. Yep. So <laughs> the one from Wednesday was about lightning. So oh, yeah. you want to go there. So I was talking all about X ray integration, but my entire summer focus was supposed to be on cross section. So what what a what about cross section? Well, this goes back to some of the thinking that did in the first part of the summer, is that cross sections really are a form of interpolation. You want to get your data from through some, so you have your data. We're assuming in the first part on a grid, but we'll eventually be able to short, support unstructured data, but it's just a sense of interpolating to some slice in three dimensions through your data. So it's a form of interpolation. But MetPy's interpolation functionality was previously in a, a sub-package called MetPy.gridding for trying to go from unstructured to gridded data, and a few assorted functions in our calculation sub-package. So adding another form to this sort of inspired an entire refactor of our interpolation functionality. So this was one of the first things I worked on during the summer was a major API switchover from Having every having a gridding sub package and stuff in MetPy.calc, to having a little bit little bit more cohesive of an interpolation sub package that can handle all that plus now cross sections. And there there is a decent amount of discussion on this. Plus so plus some issues with Python 2.7. I'll be so glad when we can move on from that. So with that out of the way, we can finally, I think, actually get to cross sections. If you look here, so there's this function with about, I don't know, seven lines of code, the geodesic construction with about 10, and the cross section function itself with about that much. So all those changes to get to something like this, just taking the cross-section. Not a whole lot, you think, going on here with the cross-section implementation itself, but there's so much going into it, just make these calls really easy, just like .metpy.cartopy.crs, getting your CRS, .x, getting whatever your arbitrary x coordinate is, making sure that our projections work well with trying to calculate geodesic paths, a lot of stuff that's happening behind the scene. And of course, discovering that 
X-Array implemented interpolation functionality in June. So when I started, we we're all I was all focused on NetPy's interpolation functionality because I didn't know that X-Ray was going to have at least basic gridded interpolation working. And then found that X-Ray's implementation, because it's based on the assumption that we use gridded data, it runs about three orders of magnitude faster. So that's what we went with for now. In the future, what we hope to do is when they when we get a good data model for unstructured data in X-Ray, hopefully we'll be able to interpret that and then use our interpolation, MetPy's interpolation code in order to interpolate when we have more scattered points and when we can't use that assumption that it's all gridded to speed up the process. So we actually can get then something that looks like this if we want to actually do a graphical example. Of course, the, actual, the, the real examples in documentation don't quite look like that. I have some nicer fonts, but you know, it fits with the theme of the presentation. That's yeah, that, that is our North American reanalysis example data set in NetPy of a nice low pressure system off the East Coast. So, with that, oh, here we go. demo time. Uh, sacrifice the goat. <laughs> yep. So I'll probably, what I first want to do is just go through a basic example of how I got to that demo that's going to be the example that's in that Pi documentation. So we have all our imports up here. Ooh, I updated Num NumPy recently. Then we're just going to get our test data. We're going to parse it all, get a new data set, squeeze down the size one time dimension. So we end up getting a nice data set that looks like this, everything on just three dimensions. Define our start endpoints as latitude longitude pairs. And then just a nice simple cross section call. And it did all of that without even, I could probably time it, but this interpolation through this 300-ish by 120 data set took almost nothing because of the fast SciPy implementation that X-Ray uses for this linear interpolation. And we have a couple more options on this cross-section function that I'm not using. You can specify the number of steps that you want in the cross-section path, and you can also specify if you want nearest neighbor interpolation instead of linear interpolation, you can do that. In the future, when we get more of NetPy's interpolation integrated, there'll be more options that can go along with that. The other thing is that because of how these are structured, and if you recall earlier, I had those three functions in the implementation of cross sections, you don't necessarily have to just do a start to end along a geodesic. You can also specify create your own custom path or between multiple points and connect multiple points via geodesics, add those, concatenate those together, and then feed those to the interpolate to slice function, and you can get your own custom cross sections. One other thing here, just to make some of the plotting things easier, we're going to turn lat and long, which in this case were variables, into coordinates. Then we could do some calculations with it. Again, going back to that problem of broadcasting, when we're working with X-rays native, X-ray objects natively, they broadcast together nicely and they understand that, but when we're working with MetPy's calculations for now, because of that unit array conversion, they end up not understanding that extra dimension information. So we, we have to broadcast them together first, make sure they're all the same shape, then we can actually calculate them and then add them back to the data set the other thing that came with all these cross-section implementation is a bunch of supporting calculations, primarily related to vector components in tangential and normal direction. That's what we can do here, get our tangential and normal wind. And then we can just sort of build up our plot piece by piece here. So first, by default, if we just stick this and give it right to matplotlib, we get something that's upside down and not scaled very well. 
we can change to a normal logarithmic pressure scale, get something a little bit better, add in our potential temperature contours, which is really useful because we can follow this to assess isentropic ascent or descent. And then let's see, I think it's winds that come on next. So we can see here that a typical assumption when you're doing isentropic cross sections at least is that your winds are mostly um, tangential to the cross section because then you can follow those paths to assess ascent or descent. But here we see a lot of normal wind, at least on this side. So we can't quite apply that same analysis in this case. And then let's see, this one adds in and I, the inset plot to end up seeing 500 millibar heights along with it. And then one more thing is to actually put our path along that here so we can see from here at that longitude over to this longitude what this path is doing going right through basically the center of the system. And then of course, because we want to actually have a nice quality plot, we should add titles and labels and all of that. <coughs> so that's how we get to that demonstration. And just looking at time, I'm a little bit close to the end, so I'll just quick run all on my little MCS demo here. All right, once it goes. So this is from some of the research I'm doing back at Iowa State doing high resolution simulations and mesoscale convective systems and were. So we get really not pretty output like this, but say I want to take a cross section to it. So I can go something like there, try just getting the main system, some of this trailing stratiform region and some maybe a little bit of convection popping up back there and whatever is going on back over here. The one downside is because this is worth, it's difficult to get the projection stuff. Otherwise, I'd be doing a little bit more showing where this actually is. It's a, it's, it's along the St. Uh, Mississippi and St. Croix River, Minnesota, Wisconsin border. And then we can take our cross section. Happened really quickly. The main th the thing that took the longest was actually reading in all the data and getting it into memory. And then we can get a nice little cross section through our Let's go back to system. And I don't think I'll have time to do live coding demo of the, trying to replicate that. Just out of curiosity, what's the mm -hmm. field of warp and dark field of reflectivity? Yeah, it's simulated reflectivity. I should have probably clarified that. DBZ interpolated is, like, I yeah, think, I what my preprocessor yeah. or post processor <laughs> called it. That's all nice, Yeah. So the X cross section only two points, can you do multiple points? With the Cross section function, the easy helper, that's just a start and end. But we also have a function called interpolate to slice, where if you give it your own set of points in whatever data projection that you have, it will be able to take a cross section along whatever other path that you want. But our easy helper is really just a start and end. But it isn't that difficult to say. I want a cross section from city A to city B to city C to city D. Construct geodesics between each of them, concatenate them all together, and then feed that to that function. And you mentioned unstructured grid. What do you mm -hmm. mean by that? So, say we just had all the upper sounding observations across the US. Those aren't data points on a regular grid, they're just scattered in space. So we would want to still, perhaps with whatever zero Z sounding odds, we want to take a cross section across some section of the US. We want, what we hope to be able to do is once we have a good data format for having all those unstructured points, to be able to give that to the interpolation routine and still be able to take a slice through that. Okay, this AD does that. Mm -hmm. So it uses what's known as the field data model. Mm -hmm. And that was worked out by a mathematician, mm -hmm. and it'll it would cover all of this. And I recommend that you read up on it. All right, keep that in mind. But we are see how that fits into X Array. But yeah, I say we, we want to use X Array. We don't okay. want to be responsible for making errors. Yeah, does does oh, X Array exactly. work with the irregular grids at all? It's a NetCDF data model, so think yeah. CF. Mm -hmm. So while I, I like the purity, I 
already don't have enough hours to do all the code I'm supposed <laughs> to maintain. So if I could take advantage of the community that's already based around X-Array, I'm happy to put whatever I can into that, but I'm not sure X-Array's life is going to include a data model to handle all the things. Whereas it's going to stick, I think, predominantly a NetCDF and dimensional type thing. Um, there are several proposals to add your regular <coughs> grids to NetCDF. And they're terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had to work terrible. with them. <laughs> so the coordinate system identification and the mm -hmm. unit stuff seems really useful, much broader than MedPy and meteorology. Is there plans to move that into X-ray or something like that? Or where will that eventually live? So there, there are some interesting discussions happening right now. Um, there, off of SciPy, there's a, there's some people that want to try going to a geo X-ray that includes coordinate this coordinate handle it or it's a little bit vague whether they want to do the coordinate identification or not. What they mainly want are concerned with is projection information, and Ryan probably knows more because he's been in more conversations about this. But there's Different things going back and forth, whether that's something that MetPy will be able to utilize if they, depending on what, how they do their implementation. Right. I think we're also in the early stages here mm -hmm. of the API design. So after that has some life and proves its robustness, I'd be more interested in foisting this upon, you know, inflicting this pain on other people too. Um, but it's a promising start, really. It's actually, the interface isn't so bad, it's more of the implementation. I question how brittle it may or may not be with the wide array of sins people commit in real data. What? <laughs> and the other thing with the units, like right now we're sticking with time quantities and it's a wrapper that we just take the data and convert it. What we're hoping to do so that you can do more native X-ray operations um, is what was mentioned before, trying to get duck arrays working for People upstream are trying to get duck arrays working a little bit better so that you can stick united arrays into X-ray amongst many other use cases for that. So that hopefully you can do more native X-ray calculations with units. But I think that's a bigger ecosystem problem than just yeah. MetPy. Great cross section work. I'll make the people who want to use GARP all the time happy. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. I'm dead serious on that. That's really nice, nice one. Maybe Garp will finally die. Maybe, maybe <laughs> the knife and Garp. Yeah. Well, the only thing that does cross section. Well, now we got something else we can mm -hmm. <laughs> and, the, and one other thing I didn't really get the chance to show in the presentation that I was able to work on this last little bit in the summer was making, starting to make some inroads into MetPy's calculations to working somewhat more natively with um, X rays. So trying to start that process with derivatives, since those are sort of a baseline calculation that you're going to need. So right, right with point 0.9, you can give an X-ray data array and tell it which axis you want the derivative on, or second derivative, and it'll give you that back. Of course, some of the implementation details are still being worked out, and but so again, it's a work in progress. Section, you think? You what was that? So, so there's hope for thermal indices in the future as well? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the whole hope is that the entire MetPy API will work with X-Ray, but that's sort of waiting for unit integration and a lot of other things. Well, it works currently, but... You don't get X-Ray back. Correct. So it's, it, we're, we're going through a migration phase mm -hmm. here. We're slowly integrating more and more, but it's, it's not a great state in terms of what mm -hmm. you're going to get back out consistently across the library at the moment. And that's something this uh, duck type duck, duck array did you call it, or is that, is that going to help with that so you can get back? I don't think it's going to be that work in the community will be completed in a timely enough yeah, fashion okay. to get us unstuck on the schedule on which we would like to operate. Like I think in two years that might be a good thing. Right, that's I'd like to have nice things to show when we go to AMS yeah, in yeah, six yeah. months. And so I think we're going to have to pursue some things not along that line, right, but sure. something that might be tightly coupled to X-Array. Right. Just kind of getting some hooks in there and manually handle units. Is this duct typing uh, help with num NumPy, NumPy arrays? It will help. 
across the ecosystem having all the different packages that do different things that are NumPy array like either handling missing data or X array or separate unit packages all follow a common protocol and interrupt across it. But right now, yeah, it's kind of bumpy. Oh, did you call it duck type or duck array? Um, you saying duck array? So I, I, I've just been reading. I, I'm not real into the conversation to know what the best terminology for all of it is. But the whole idea is that if it walks like a duck and it right. talks like a duck, call it a duck. Right. And so, so if it implements the API, it should treat it like it's that object. I, yes, right, right. So, so duck typing is basically Python's typing model, largely. Um, I mean, it does have but classes array and stuff, array does, don't really do that. So there is no duck array. There's no generic array oh, type. There's subclasses which work, except there are certain design decisions were made where it becomes very easy for the subclass to get stripped down to the base class. And so you lose all your special information that you want to track units, missing data, right, right. X array. And it becomes very hard without going through a lot of effort to implement the entirety of yeah. the NumPy array to get everything to work. That's what the community is trying to do. I think we're going to try and take a smaller piece and just get a few hooks, make this one problem work, because we're just trying to work with X-Array and let the rest of the community sort out. Right, yeah, I was, I was asking only long term. Long term, yeah. Seems clear I think long, long term, <laughs> that's the path. Short term, we'll get something. Yeah. And I apologize for not having as much demos together. I was hoping to have some more, but I get sidetracked reading interesting problems like this. <laughs> or, or working on, um, our, our latest little thing is tuple indexing, or non-tuple indexing in NumPy. It was deprecated of the latest version, and we were using a lot of list-based indexing. So trying to get that cleaned up, and our current fix turned a lot of the code into a mess, and trying to figure out ways to clean that up. But intro, lots of interesting problems, but not a whole lot of time. Good luck in grad school, John. Thank you. <laughs> I will need it. I will need it. So I guess I could just conclude with some thank you. So thank you again to Ryan and John for helping and putting up with my incessant PRs, even though you've been <laughs> gone a lot on trips and conferences and sci-fi and all of that. Um, Sean for putting up with my little thread side queries and all of that. Um, Inkin and Sherry, thank you for all of the logistics and managing housing and actually having a place to stay while we're here. Uh, Matt, for having a nice monitor right off the bat, and then an even better one a week later that has served me well throughout the summer. Um, Ethan, for approving my paychecks. And everybody here for the great lunch conversations, good conferences, or brown bags and all of that. So it was a very good summer. And XKCD, use under Creative Commons license. Have to get that in there. And just a general conclusion about what I learned about software uh, development. I think holes in the wall, yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I think that's about all I have. So. <laughs>